are live. A very good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, episode 326. And we as Plasti Fellows are super excited because we are beginning with Ocloplasty module now. And today is episode one. And who better to kickstart the module than the master himself, Dr. Santosh sir. And he'll be talking on practical anatomy of eyelids, which is the part one. And uh, part two will follow soon. So a very warm welcome to you, sir. And over to you. Thank you so much. So conventionally, we begin all our modules with anatomy. And for this, I tried to find speakers. I asked many uh, oculoplasty speakers, potential oculoplasty speakers, and all of them, I don't know why they refused. And I started putting this lecture together. And then I realized that it cannot be finished in one class because even I laid such a small structure is, is so vast in its anatomy and its description that I could only complete part of it. And that's what I'm going to do today, complete part of the eyelid anatomy, and then proceed with the second part along with the ptosis evaluation. Who said this? You. Nobody actually, yeah, you know, it's, it's yeah. just intuitive that uh, your surgical skills follow your anatomical skills. Of course, anatomical dissection does not guarantee surgical results, especially in ptosis surgery, but this is the principle of any surgery, knowing your anatomy so that you avoid complications and get the best of outcome. And eyelid happens to be the most complex specialized facial adaptation. It is an organ of expression actually, and it is the most dynamic and expressive of aesthetic structures in the human body. Not just that it is not an isolated structure, it is intricately connected to the rest of the facial anatomy, lacrimal system and orbit. And most important functions are, it, are that it protects the eye, it moistens the eye and cleanses the ocular surface by its action on the ocular surface. Said that it's the most complex aesthetic functional unit of the body and contributes equally to both the elements. These are the components of general eyelid anatomy. We start always with topography and talk about the intricate connections of the eyelid to rest of the facial structures by talking about mass a little bit, then go on to the eyebrow, talk about eyelid skin, then describe eyelid margin in great detail, go on to the parts of the orbicularis oculi, medial canthal and lateral canthal ligament, orbital septum. And in the next class, possibly we'll cover levator, mullers, lower lid retractors, blood supply, nerve supply and lymphatics, which are all again very important. This is the picture that we are very familiar with, isn't it? So we simply know that these are the structures that exist in the eyelid, but we have never bothered to understand what is the relationship of each of these structures and how many parts each of these structures are made up of. This is the lower lid anatomy. And if you look at it, it looks very simple. But when you go structure by structure, delve deep into anatomy, you understand how complex it is. Let's begin with topography. So looking at this picture, what all would you want to explain, Chef Ali? Can you quickly, everything is written here, so you simply have to verbalize it. Yeah, so sir, when we see the uh, eye and the eyelid as such, we have mm. to describe it in uh, palpable fissure. So yeah. it, uh, vertical palpable fissure, as it's mentioned here, is generally in an adult, uh, it will be around uh, uh, 10, 10 millimeters. 9 eight. to 11 millimeters is the range. Yes, sir. And then uh, horizontal palpable fissure. And then we see the upper eye, where the upper eye... palpable fissure, generally we talk about 28 to 30, but in certain races, it's wider, such as Asian, Indians, it's wider, Caucasians, it's wider, Oriental, it is narrower. So there is a range to it. Mm -hmm. And if it is more than that range, suppose it is 35, then obviously you think of certain conditions. If it is 18, 20, you think of certain conditions. We'll come to that a little later. Yeah. Okay. Then... Then we see uh, like the eyelids per se, where, where the upper eyelid is uh, lying and where the lower eyelid is, eyelid is lying. So upper eyelid generally covers two millimeter of the cornea and lower eyelid generally is at the lower end of the limbus and they join at the medial and the lateral canthus at an angle of 60 degrees. Correct. So we see that. And uh, medial is more acute, lateral is about 60 degrees. 
Yeah, and medial is slightly lower than the lateral one where it's meeting. Right, about two millimeter, two to four millimeter is considered normal, so to say, range. Beyond that, of course, again that has racial racial connotations. But if it is beyond that, then you call it a particular slant. Mm. Depending on which canthus is higher, we'll come to that. You can call it mongoloid slant or anti-mongoloid slant, each of which is associated not just with racial variations, but also with certain diseases and syndromes. Go ahead. So then we see the eyelid crease, uh, because mm. that is important in all the surgeries that we do. The upper eyelid crease uh, generally would be around uh, eight millimeters from the eyelid margin and the lower eyelid crease as, as it's mentioned here it's uh, like three to four millimeters from the lower eyelid margin so we can uh, plan our incisions accordingly when we are doing the surgeries and then uh, we see the distance of uh, basically from the brow if we ask the patient to look down and we want to see the vertical lid height in certain surgeries like blepharoplasty so we measure that from the eyebrow uh, or the superior superior orbital margin to the uh, lid margin so that will be the vertical the lid patient looking down down and you want at least 18 millimeter of the lid left at the end of the plexoplasty generally it can range from say 20 to 24 even 25 26 millimeter is possible and it is grossly increased in patients who have which condition whenever we talk about anatomy you have to talk about variations and variations not just are racial but also mean diseases so when you have a patient with grossly increased vertical lid height, which condition along with grossly increased horizontal lid height, I mean horizontal uh, lid length, which condition are you talking about? Upper lid. Floppy syndrome. Okay. okay. So this is what this picture shows and it also shows the distance between the bro and the orbital margin, which is very variable. This 10 millimeter that this picture shows is mainly in females. But in males, the brow lies just at the superior orbital margin. In females, the lateral component of the brow may be about 6, 8, 10 millimeter higher than the superior orbital margin. Everything else, I think we have already explained very nicely, except for the part, fact that this part of the junction of uh, the ciliated portion of the eyelid with the non-ciliated portion of the eyelid differentiates Pars ciliaris from pars lacrimalis, and the length of pars lacrimalis is about 5 millimeter. Now, this is the slant that I talked about mongoloid and anti mongoloid. Normal, we say that it is about 2 millimeter higher, but if it is much higher like that, then that is called mongoloid slant. And typical mongoloid slant is seen in Down syndrome, with which it gets its name. Anti mongoloid slant or downward slanting palpable fissure is typical of Apert syndrome and Tresha Collins syndrome. Although the list is endless, known as syndrome, there are many syndromes that, that are part of it. So it is part of facial dysmorphism, along with low set tears and labial malformations. Everything else put together is a complex facial dysmorphism set of features. So if you find your patient has any of this, then you should explore, explore for the possibility of other facial dysmorphism features and possibly put together a syndrome if that fits into the syndrome. That is the importance of this. It's very difficult to go through each of these syndromes and give you a list, but you should simply remember that there is something called normal, which is two to four millimeter higher lateral canthus than the medial canthus. If it is beyond that, it is possibly pathological. If it is against the normal slant, if it is anti-mongoloid slant, then you should consider certain syndromes. Now, this picture shows the concept of eyelid crease, tassel platform show, and bro fat span. Eyelid crease is the lid crease that appears first when the patient looks from extreme down gaze to up gaze. So ask the patient to look extreme down and as the patient starts looking up, the first fold of skin, definite fold of skin that appears is the eyelid crease. And that is where you measure the margin crease distance. Now, since the eyelid crease is not planar, it has this nice tuck. This part of the skin overhangs the eyelid crease. And that causes two differentiating parts in the eyelid when the patient looks primarily or in straight that's called tarsal platform show, the part of the epitarsal skin that is shown under the overhanging eyelid crease is called tarsal platform show or TPS. 
and the skin above that up to the lower margin of the bro irrespective of whether the patient has trimmed or plucked the bro is called the bro fat span so this is a concept that we use in blepharoplasty to give a very nice tarsal platform so especially asian late surgery that if a patient wants a particular amount of tarsal platform so that can be given as part of the surgical procedure and if the palpable fissure is narrow 18 is the cut off but anything between 18 to 21 is okay then you call it blepharophimosis so in blepharophimosis there are many associated features and that we will learn as we go by with the diseases whereas if the palpable fissure is wide and if it is abnormally wide associated with lengthening of not just the pars ciliaris but also pars lacrimalis in this patient is about 10 mm along with lateral ectropion of the upper lid and the lateral ectropion of the lower lid and of course because of all this the patient will have some exposure issues poor orbicularis development and this patient note also tend to have a shorter upper eyelid height that and also shorter lower eyelid height but the fissure is wide that may result in corneal exposure and some amount of corneal epithelial or stromal damage result in chronic exposure and corneal opacity very rarely this is called uri blepharon whereas if a patient doesn't have that doesn't have lateral ectopion so much has the normal vertical lid height of both the upper lid as well as the lower lid yet the pars lacrimalis is expanded more than its normal 5 mm and the medial canthus has a beak like projection look actually looks like a bird's beak and if the patient has more hair here called synophrys and the hair is very bushy right and the distance between the medial limbus to medial canthus is almost equal to lateral limbus to lateral canthus and you call it centurion syndrome associated features are a very prominent nasal bridge now for the lid crease of course we talked about the upper lid crease the higher the upper lid crease which means that possibly there is levator disinsertion or dehiscence in upper lid the only overhanging skin Uh, that happens is in patients who have dermatocalosis or blepharocalosis or patients who have asian descent but in lower eyelid it can happen in any child like this child has what is called epicanthal or sorry the epiblepharon when this extends to involve the medial canthus then it is called epicanthal fold there are many varieties of epicanthal folds and we'll talk about that in in blepharophimosis now when we talk about the eyelid we have to talk about certain fissures and grooves and folds around the eyelid as well there is something called palpebromalar groove that is on the lateral side temporal here that actually limits eyelid edema not infiltration and here is the nasojugal groove or nasolabial and this is the nasolabial fold which are important nasolabial fold is important it's called also called mesolabial fold within which run the angular vessels so when you give a, a filler or an injection in that area you should be very careful because that can cause bleeding and also call cause embolism if you are in, injecting a filler the nasal jugal groove is something that patients sometimes may be worried about uh, as part of cosmesis and you may have to address that and also look about look for the labella wrinkles which could be horizontal or vertical and each of it indicates over action of a particular set of muscle which will come to this is how the normal facial musculature looks like this is you can see that it is very very complex and orbicularis are not isolated from this facial musculature because deeper down they are joined together by what is called smas smas is nothing but superficial muscular oponeurotic system it was described by mitz and parony and it has come to be a layer or a plane where most of the face lift surgeries happen smas is used for lifting the mid face and it is a very useful procedure understanding of smas is very important if you're a facial aesthetic surgeon it invests everything this layer is all pervasive right from the platysma right up to the orbicularis every muscle is invested by smas and there are several segmental uh, parts of the smas that have also been described zygomatic subzygomatic mesentric parotid platysmal and platysmal cervical portion of smas have been described but all of them act 
together and sometimes there is segmental action as well limiting the activity of smas to a particular set of muscles the importance of smas is that when you dissect at that level you find that the facial nerve branches are below it so you're actually not damaging any of the nerves when you dissect in the plane of smas and some of the facelift surgeries happen with threads etc so even that has to pass through a particular plane so that there is no damage to the underlying structures it's like a uh, you know the architecture of fibromuscular architecture in the face is like a tree this is if this is the skin all these are intricate connections of uh, fibro fibrous septae that interdigitate and invest in the posterior layer of skin so the muscles of facial expression or the animations of the muscles of facial expression are seamlessly transmitted to the skin because that's what you finally see muscles may act deeper but if that action is not seamlessly transmitted to the facial skin then the expression remain expression they are not seen externally and that is why this particular mechanism is evolved by the nature where all these are transmitted and smas is a structure that holds this architecture together as one single layer so without having to bother about each of these intricate septae if you simply use mass as a surgical layer then you will be acting on all of them together so that is the importance of smas that it is a global unifier of all these intricate structures let's go to the eyebrow eyebrow has one of the thickest skins in the body some of the other peculiarities of the eyebrow is that it has very thick subcutaneous fibro adipose layer in fact it is the differentiator of the scalp from the eyelid so that is a abrupt transition of scalp from the eyelid and the junction is the eyebrow and it has large and crowded hair follicles in fact the hair density of scalp is higher than that of some parts of the scalp of the brow is higher than some parts of the scalp it also has pilosebaceous units and sweat glands and peculiarity about eyebrow is that it is intricately related to some of the muscles such as frontalis procerus corrugator supercilii etc now what is important about this picture is that you should never shave off pro or if you have seen patients who have undergone radiation their pro takes a long time to grow because there is a lag between the active growth phase and the total life span so if the pro grows for about pro hair grows for about 8 weeks and the life span of the pro hair is 6 months so there is a gap of about 4 months so if you have shaven the bro and if the hair that has been shaven are have finished their active growth phase and they're just maintaining at that length they won't grow back again because you have cut them off or shaven at the end of their active growth phase suppose you catch them at that phase and it will take about 3 or 4 months for this bro hair to grow back so depending on which part of the hair has been shaven some parts may grow back and some parts may not grow back so quickly but it is not a good idea at all to shave off pro hair even if it's a very bad laceration if you try to use that pro actually as a guide to repair eyelid lac or the periocular laceration and not to shave off hair which is sometimes done in emergency rooms no pro hair also has an architecture especially if you are reconstructing the pro or making incision around the pro you should make sure that the shape of the pro is maintained and it should be symmetrical with the contralateral lid try not to change the shape of the bro because that will look extremely bad because that will not be asymmetric now bro hair has three components one is the medial portion is almost straight especially in females it is more straighter than males then there is central fourth fifth which is in two angles there is one upper layer which comes down and the lower layer which goes up and they meet in what is called a raphe so there is overlapping of hair from the upper part and the lower part and that continues and finally the lateral portion is very long and it it is called the tail of the bro and they tend to be pointing down they don't generally tend to be pointing up so this is the lateral portion this is the medial portion where you can see that the bro hair is pointing up the central 3/4 or 4/5 actually conforms to this kind of an architecture there is a central raphe and there is downward 30 degree pointing hair growth from the top 
and 30 degree pointing hair growth from the bottom, which meet at the center point. So you should remember this whenever you pluck your bro or you can reshape, reshape the bro or even suture the bro. And there's a huge difference between the bro between males and females. You should not feminize a man and masculinize a woman. So it's important to know that uh, there is a difference. Difference, of course, is the male bro is bushy. It has thicker hair. And apart from that, the, uh, the initial portion of the bro uh, is very small in head. Head of the bro is smaller in males. Whereas uh, in females, you can see that there is vertical hair. And the tail of the bro is very longer or longer in females as compared to males. Apart from that, the bro itself is at a lower position in men as compared to women. So that picture that I showed you earlier shows the bro position. And in women, it, the lateral part of the bro may be as high as 8 to 10 millimeter from the superior orbital margin. So this is the uh, head of the bro, this is the body of the bro, and this is the tail of the bro. And in females, you can see that the tail is more sharper and more pointed down. And uh, the middle is almost the same length. What is this condition called? Unibro. Pardon? Louder. Unibro. Unibro. I haven't heard that. Ritika is smiling. You can also answer, Ritika. You know everything, I know. What is this? Tujuji, first question to you. What is this? Hmm? There's a term to it. Simple term. Synopsis. Synopsis. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and it is not unusual for hirsute individuals to have it. But at the same time, it is associated with several entities. The most important, of course, is we already described that. What is it? The Centurion syndrome. Centurion. Centurion syndrome is very famous. For synophilis. Apart from that, I have listed 14 conditions where synophilis can be present, including Pashuaka. So synophilis is not something normal. And if a patient or an individual has synophilis, and if you think that he has other ocular features, say, example, mucopolysaccharidosis, etc., then you should be able to be putting together a diagnosis. Now, eyebrow is also superficial plane, uh, muscle plane of the face. It's part of it, part of SMAS we already talked about. And most important aspect is that the frontalis and orbicularis interdigitated the eyebrow, resulting in its gross animation that it is capable of. Corrugator supercilia inserts to the skin of the medial eyebrow. Depressor supercilia inserts to the medial bony orbit inferior to the corrugator supercilia. And angular vessels actually pass between the two heads of the depressor supercilia. So whenever you do orbital excentration or any surgery in the supramedial portion of the orbit, if you see the depressor supercilia, you, you would be able to see angular vessels very close thereby. And you can actually separate the deeper part of the depressor supercilia and the superficial part, two heads of it between which the angular vessels pass. Procerus is supposed to be continuous with the frontalis. When you look at it at a superficial plane, you see galea aponeurotica, which actually splits to enclose the frontalis, and then it continues. It continues in the suborbicularis plane. It continues to enclose the orbicularis in front as well as behind. And you can see that this is the which muscle is this? The arrow is pointing. That's procerus. And this is the depressor supercilia. Okay, and where do you find corrugator supercilia? Beneath that. You absolutely right. This is depressor depressor supercilia. It actually projects between the procerus and the orbital portion of the orbicularis. That is how it appears. And when you cut it deep, you find that corrugator supercilia muscle. So if you are describing the muscles from posterior to anterior, which I keep asking you during excentration, the first muscle that you encounter is, of course, orbicularis, orbital part, and fibers of frontalis, where the orbicularis, orbital part, merges with the frontalis. When you dissect it out, you will find extreme medial portion, two muscles. One is procerus, and next to it, you will find 
the peeping head of the depressor supercilia. Once you dissect that, then you will find corrugator supercilia. So corrugator supercilia is the deepest muscle beyond which there is just periosteum. So when you're dissecting in the supromedial aspect, you find that the muscle layer is extremely thick because it contains not one, but four muscles. so much that sometimes it, it is very difficult to differentiate one muscle from the other. So it is considered by some anatomists that these are all parts of the same muscle that is the obiclaris. But that is not right because they are from different planes, their origin is different and they are also supplied by different branches of the same nerve. Now clinical applications is that whenever you make incisions in the eyebrow, the incision should be parallel to the hair and you should never cut the brow perpendicularly. So vertical incision is contraindicated in the eyebrow. If a patient comes with an eyebrow laceration, you find that there is a huge gape in the eyebrow. That's because of the muscle. The intricate interplay of muscles of the eyebrow make this kind of a gape, which is sometimes scary, but you have to start repairing it from the deeper aspect. You pry open the wound, start repairing it from the deeper aspect. And keep the eyebrow hair as one of the landmarks to put the brow together and never to shave as we already did. This, I think if it plays, it will be good. Mm, it's not playing. Any, okay, good. It's playing, I suppose. Are you able to see this? Yes, sir. Yes. This is just for fun. This is called bro dance. Just to show you that bro can be trained. And Bharatanatyam dances, of course, know how to use that bro. Bro is capable of extreme degree of animation. Okay, I think I've gone out of the slideshow already. Right. Yeah, so this is one patient of ptosis who has very severe ptosis. So she's able to lift the bro. But unfortunately, post laying, we expect that the patient use their frontalis. And sometimes they're not able to use the frontalis. They don't have the inducement, especially if they're amblyopic. But otherwise, bro is capable of so much of work. And the range of bro movement is not just 10 millimeter, which is the minimal requirement for tarsofrontal sling. Whenever a patient has a need for tarsofrontal sling, we should always measure the frontalis action. If it is less than 10 millimeter, then the patient may not be able to use the sling that you have performed on him. Normal range of the bro movement is 25, 35 millimeters, 25 millimeter up and 10 millimeter down from its normal position. So the range is 35 millimeters. Out of the 35, the patient should have at least 10 millimeter left for tarsofrontal sling. And one more peculiarity is about, about the bro is that the lateral one-fourth of the bro lacks frontalis muscle. So lateral bro lacks an elevator, right? That is the, that's one of the reasons why there is a lateral bro droop in many patients who have blephrochalysis or dermatochalysis. And in such patients, you can give Botox to the lateral orbicularis which is a sphincter. To relax the lateral orbicularis, if you give Botox, then there would be elevation of the lateral aspect of the bro. That's a practical tip because the lateral part of the bro, extreme lateral part of the bro, lacks frontalis in many patients. Now about practical points about the anatomy of uh, corrugator, procerus, and depressor are these. Corrugator and procerus depress the medial eyebrow and whenever you do a bro lift, you have to necessarily weaken the corrugator and procerus by surgery. So obviously you decapacitate it by doing the section or excising part of it. So that's a part of pro lift. And you can also give botulinum toxin injection. You should also remember that corrugator produces vertical glabella folds. If you find a patient with vertical glabella folds as this, then the muscle to inject is corrugator supercilia. You know where it is and you can go inject about two to five units and the vertical 
level of folds can be taken care of. And if a patient has horizontal level of folds, then procerus is the culprit and you go and Botox it. Two to four units or five units of Botox in the procerus should take care of horizontal level of folds. So you should know what you're looking at, which muscle causes this particular deformity and take care of it by appropriate procedures. Now, other practical implications are that the deep calia divides to encompass the pro fat pad. And that is, if you're fond of some names, it's called cushion of charpy. And the posterior layer continues as the posterior orbicularis fascia, which is called the potaman uris layer. So if you're doing trans breath bro lift, suppose, or bro pexy, suppose you're doing blepharoplasty and you want to fix the bro at the same time, then you should always follow the posterior orbicularis fascia or suborbicularis plane is the plane that should be followed to get to the periosteum so that you can fix that bro, which is droopy. So you should never lose the plane, then you'll go keep going deeper and you'll not find the correct layer. So the putaman uris layer is the layer to follow for bro pexy when you do transplef. The next important thing is that the bro fat actually condenses into deep fibrous layer and merges with the orbital septum. Now, if you're a beginner ptosis surgeon, what may happen is you have started your lit crease incision and you're going high, right? Suborbicular is plane of dissection. Now, this is the orbital septum and that is the fat that we expect. Suppose that is higher and there is herniation of the subbro fat, then you will find that fat here, which is whiter and coarser and more fibrotic. And you'll think that it is the septum, this as the septum. Or if you keep on going higher in the suborbicularis plane, you will encounter this particular layer, subbro fat, which is descended down. And you will make this incision, but you'll not find the levator there. You'll find more fat and then you'll find one more layer, which will be the septum and the levator, but you would have gone very high on the levator already. So if you're a beginner ptosis surgeon, you should understand that there is downward descent of pro fat pad sometimes, which you may confuse with preoponeurotic fat pad. So you should always remember and never go too high in the suborbicularis plane when you're doing ptosis surgery. And we already talked about temporal bro droop, the gender difference. And what I want to emphasize is that evaluation of the bro is an integral part of eyelid evaluation, specifically that of ptosis and blepharoplasty. Let's go to eyelid skin. Now, eyelid skin is very thin. And between uh, bro and the eyelid skin and the cheek and the eyelid skin, there is abrupt transition. Bro is thick, cheek is thick, but the eyelid skin itself is very thin. In fact, it is the thinnest skin in the body. I have already mentioned the measurements. Otherwise, I thought I would ask any some of you. It is about 1.4 millimeter thick under the bro, right under the eyebrow. 0.3 millimeter, very close to the anterior lid margin. So from 1.1 millimeter under the bro, it actually becomes thinner and thinner and becomes thinnest, very close to the anterior lid margin. The thinnest part of the skin is not just the lid skin, but the medial part of the lid skin closer to the lid margin is the thinnest. It's only 0.2 millimeter or 200 micron thick. It is highly flexible, can be flexed to or, or stretched to about three times depending on the age. That is the reason if you have done a surgery or if a patient has minor infection, the lid can swell up a lot because it is highly stretchable and edema can actually stretch it a lot. It has very thin subcutaneous tissue and in the epitarsal plane, there is no subcutaneous tissue at all and there are very sparse appendages. It's unusual to find air on the eyelid. Now, what are the good points about the thinness of the eyelid is that it produces very fast healing. It's vascular as well with minimal scar. Bad is that the edema can be very severe. If you have a similar amount of surgical trauma on the hand and leg, you may not get so much edema. But if you do even a minor surgery on the eyelid, sometimes you get unusual amount of edema. Sometimes the lid skin can get permanently stretched because of lack of subcutaneous tissue support. It can get permanently stretched causing blepharocalysis and dermatocalysis. The most important practical aspect is that it's very difficult to find a matching skin for the eyelid skin graft. 
like to like, you have to go to the contralateral lid. And if the patient doesn't permit use of the contralateral lid, you cannot take it from the lower lid for sure. Then you'll have to go for retroauricular or medial arm graft or supraclavicular graft, which will give you very thick skin, which may be different in texture, which will have a lot of thick dermis and it may have hair growth as well. So these are the practical aspects about the eyelid skin. Now, eyelid margin, as we already talked about, has two parts. One is pars palpebralis, which is medial to the puncta, and pars, lac pars lacrimalis, which is medial to the puncta, and pars palpebralis, which is lateral to the puncta. The differentiating feature is that you find the puncta at the interjunction of these two parts of the eyelid, and lashes suddenly stop, very abruptly stop at the puncta. Sometimes lashes can continue medial to the puncta, and that generally happens in patients with blepharophimosis or in patients who have centurion syndrome. If you find that this part of the eyelid is smaller than normal, suppose it is hardly 2 millimeter and puncta is very close to the medial canthal, medial canthal angle, then those patients tend to have canalicular dysgenesis. So in patients who have a punctal dysgenesis, if you find the pars lacrimal is very short or hardly not there, you can expect canalicular dysgenesis as well. So your option of doing a canalicular cut down or canaliculostomy will not exist if a patient does not have the canaliculus at all. So it should be measuring the pars lacrimalis in patients who have punctal agenesis or punctal dysgenesis or a small congenital puncta or punctal, uh, you know, patients who have a punctal deformity or where you don't find the punctal papilla at all. And generally, it is lengthened in patients who have uriblepharon and it is also lengthened in patients who have centurion syndrome. And when you take a cross section, you will find that the pars lacrimalis has a rounded contour. In the middle of it, you will find the canaliculus, whereas pars palpebralis or, uh, is actually square in contour as I have shown here. And that is the puncta, that is the junction. And Puncta, where exactly is the puncta located in terms of layer? Which layer is the puncta? In which layer is the puncta located? Ruju, what is there to think about it? Is it located in the Kanyangteva? Is it located in the tarsus? Is it located in the skin oviclaris? Is that a difficult question? So the conjunctiva. Huh? Where is puncta located? Subha. Skin orbicularis. Skin orbicularis. You're way off. Look where the puncta is located. This is the puncta, right? And what is this peeping through? That is the terminal portion of the tarsus. So puncta is actually located. Where? Answer now at least. In the term portion of the tarsus, it is a tough structure. And medial to it, of course, it passes in the pars lacrimalis under the muzzle. And which muzzle are we talking about? Superficial head of superior and inferior pretarsal orbicularis, which invests the medial portion of the or the terminal portion of the tarsus and invest the canaliculus as well, lower as well as upper. So this is the punctum, right? Mm -hmm. And from there, the canaliculus would start and go more medially. The peculiarities about the eyelids, eye, eyelashes, eyelashes point up and out in the upper eyelid. They point up and out in the upper eyelid and down and out in the lower eyelid. Number of eyelashes are often asked 100 to 150 in the upper eyelid in three to six rows, depending on the patient, gender, race, etc. They can vary. Length is about 8 to 12 millimeter. Of course, you find patients who have hypertrichosis, who have very long lashes. Patients can also have short lashes. Now, there are prostaglandin analogs which can make the lashes grow longer. So, you can grow your lashes longer, but Generally, the range of lash is about 8 to 12 millimeter in the upper eyelid. In the lower eyelid, 50 to 75 lashes may be present in 2 to 3 rows. 
sparse on the medial side in the lower eyelid and little more sparse in the medial side on the upper eyelid 4 to 6 mm long is the length of the medial uh, lower eyelid eyelashes now lash follicles are located 2.4 mm deep in the upper eyelid and 1.4 mm deep in the lower eyelid of course there is a range why is it important is because when you do electrolysis you have to go that much deep to get to the lash follicle if you are superficial you'll only be burning the lash without destroying the lash follicle lashes are highly innervated and sensitive they compared to cats whiskers actually whenever something touches the lash the first reflex that you do is blink right so lashes are highly sensitive now is there something called uh, lash hair raising experience similarly do you have any lash raising experience do lashes have erect up eye like to choose thinking deep do lashes have erect up eye like pratika can answer this question no that's the peculiarity they don't have erect up eye like that's why i put that question do are lashes the thickest hair in the body no i thought it's no but books write that lash are the thickest but i think it's wrong but most of the books write that lash are the thickest hair in the body and lashes take about 6 to 8 weeks to grow back and like bro which takes often 4 to 6 months to grow back so it is okay to pluck lashes but the clinical implication is that if a patient comes to you with plucked lashes and if he is come to you for electrolysis or cryotherapy or for any procedure for trichiasis and dystichiasis you should not do it unless you wait for 6 to 8 weeks for the rashes to grow back we say 3 weeks is the borderline 3 weeks you find very small stubs of lashes which can still be used for electrolysis and cryotherapy but 6 to 8 weeks is the ideal time when you should be doing a surgical procedure on patients who have trichiasis and dystichiasis if they have already plucked their lash and the 3 month is a lifetime for a lash so the phase between the growth and the ultimate uh, loss of lash is only about 6 weeks so 6 weeks is the time that it takes to grow back now other uh, clinical applications is that there is something called lash ptosis which indicates about ob ob optimal orbicularis and rhylan muscle support and also precludes posterior approach ptosis surgery so if the lashes are pointing up like that that's okay that's called normal lash position if the lashes are pointing horizontal or if the lashes are pointing down that means this patient has a tendency for lash ptosis this patient already has lash ptosis so if you do a posterior approach ptosis surgery in a patient with lash ptosis lashes will come down like that obscuring the pupillary axis and cause diffraction and visual symptoms and they may even touch the cornea we talked about trichomegaly which is long lashes madarosis is obviously Uh, patients who have hypothyroidism can have madarosis some patients also have a habit of plucking their lashes and that can also cause madarosis and madarosis can also be a part of uh, any patient who has generalized madarosis now there are other abnormalities of lashes called cilia incarnata when the lashes grow internally towards the tarsus and come out to the palpebral conjunctiva or grow externally and come out higher than the lash line suppose this is the lid and these are the lashes if the lashes are seen here somewhere higher up that's called cilia crescere externum it can also be called internum when they grow inside there's something called cow lash deformity if this is a lash and if you have lost the lateral lash and you have only the medial lash that can happen in extreme lephroplasty when you go very close to the lash follicles in an attempt to kind of uh, dissect in a beginner surgeon sand it can happen where the medial lashes are preserved and the lash lateral lashes may be lost or in ptosis surgery it can happen that's called cow lash deformity cows are supposed to typically have the medial two thirds of the eyelid covered with lashes and the lateral part is missing unlike the cartoon cows that you see where the lashes are very prominent lashes are home for parasites and lashes loss of lashes can also harbing a malignancy so this is an example of a patient where there is lash ptosis you can see lashes are covering the pupillary axis here this patient definitely uh, will get complicated when you do an anti posterior approach levator surgery you are supposed to do anterior approach surgery there this is a patient with sebaceous gland carcinoma where lashes can be sparse or lost 
This is a patient with malignancy of the Zeiss gland where the tumor presents at the intermarginal strip. Now about the eyelid margin itself. These are the parts of the eyelid margin. Eyelid is supposed to be, eyelid margin is supposed to be about 2 millimeter thick. Now we have the anterior lid margin, as the name indicates, this is the anterior lid margin. Then we have the meibomian gland orifices. These circles indicate meibomian gland orifices. Then there is what is called a gray line, posterior to the meibomian gland orifices. Then we have the mucocutaneous junction, which can actually be stained with any of the vital dyes that you use. Mucocutaneous junction can stain, and if it is evident, it is called a Marx line, if you are uh, fond of names. Then there is marginal conjunctiva, which is called the viper of the eyelid and the posterior lid margin, which is the sharp lid margin. Now here there is a concept of occlusal zone. This is often talked about by dry eye specialists, but as oculoplasty specialists, we also should know about the occlusal zone. Can anybody describe what is occlusal zone? Tithi, Tuju, what is occlusal zone? So how? I already showed it here, isn't it? So this is a large zone incorporating the anterior lid margin, meibomian gland orifices, mucocutaneous. Yeah, mucocutaneous junction, and the strip of conjunctiva. That's the entire zone is called the occl occlusive zone because when the eye blinks, when there is blinking. When the upper eyelid touches the lower eyelid, that is the area where the upper eyelid comes in contact with the lower eyelid. And that is how redistribution of tears happen. That is how discharge of sebum and mebum happen. There is sebum and mebum. Both are secreted in the eyelid. You know that, right? Which gland secretes sebum and which gland se secretes mebum. It's shown in the slide. There are three types of glands in the eyelid. Sweat glands, those are glands of mole. Sebum is secreted by glands of size and mebum is secreted by the mebomian glands. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the crop cut section of the eyelid. You can see that this is the anterior lid margin. There is this epidermis and epidermis continues. There are hair follicles there and you can see that and epidermis continues until there is conjunctiva that comes in to join it and that is the mucocutaneous line. So this is the sharp posterior eyelid margin, which is formed by the conjunctiva. And the marginal conjunctiva extends up to the groove. That is the supratarsal groove, which is seen when you evert the lid, you find a very subtle groove. That is the supratarsal groove. That is up to which the marginal conjunctiva extends. And it comes to meet the skin there. And that is called the mucocutaneous junction and these are the meibomian glands which discharge here that is the meibomian gland orifice and here are the Zeiss glands. Zeiss glands as I said produce sebum and Zeiss glands are associated with lash follicles. The practical application is that if a patient has a sebaceous gland carcinoma arising from the Zeiss glands it affects the lash follicles first. So lashes will be lost sooner. But if a patient has a meibomian gland carcinoma, it has to actually go and infiltrate the lash follicles it's quite a distance away from the lash follicles. So it takes a while for the lashes to be lost in a patient who has sebaceous gland ar carcinoma arising from the meibomian glands. Whereas if it's a Zeiss gland, sebaceous gland carcinoma, the lashes will be the first to lost, first to be lost. And how many glands are there? You should simply remember 20 to 30, 30 to 40, and 40 to 50. Mols, meibomian, and Zeiss in that order. So there are fewer Mols glands, which are sweat glands, 30 to 40 meibomian glands, and 40 to 50 Zeiss glands in the upper lid. Then in the lower lid, it is just minus 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and 30 to 40 Mols, meibomian, and Zeiss glands. And what is important is the relationship of the muscle of Ryland to the meibomian glands. Now, I just wanted to ask, any of you can answer this. What exactly is the gray line? The gray line uh, is formed by the muscle of uh, Reolin. Mm -hmm. That is the gray line. It's... Uh... Subha, is she right? Is she right? 
gray line is supposed to be a surgical plane where you can supply so, skin muscle lamina and tarsal conjunctival lamina isn't it so that's what you thought was gray line so is she correct or is she wrong expert comments by ms <laughs> she's correct about it yeah she's, yeah, yeah she's correct so this is actually a quiz question gray line is formed by the muscle of rhino also it is a surgical plane but what books write don't believe the, most of the books write that the first suture that should be passed in lid marginal repair margin repair should be in the gray line in fact it is the weakest plane of the ila it's a mm -hmm. surgical plane you should never mm -hmm. pass suture at the gray line you should always pass suture at the mebomin gland orifices which are slightly posterior to the gray line so if you pass your suture through the tarsus that is when you localize the mebomin gland orifices and pass your sutures just about there then you actually don't need a posterior lid marginal suture at all so your first suture would be here and the second suture would be anterior then you don't need the posterior suture at all so three suture repair is actually a two suture repair where you pass your primary suture through the tarsus localize the mebomin gland orifices and pass just about there and the second suture anterior to it this is the clinical application just a picture showing the same this is the skin side you can see the occlusal skin all over and this is the mebomin gland which is discharging here mebomin gland orifices and the muscles are rayalin are around the mebomin gland orifices and that is the reason they work on these orifices mebomin glands to milk out, milk out the mebomian gland secretions so the action of rayalin glands of rayalin are very important although it is said that orbicularis and glands of rayalin work in conjunction to milk out the mebomian gland secretions uh, more uh, importance is given to muscles of rayalin so these are actually functional glands these are isolated part of orbicularis in fact muscles of rayalin are part of orbicularis in fact orbicularis has many parts and we'll come to that so that is the next part that's about orbicularis of gland again it's part of the superficial muscle plane and it is variably supported from the skin the distance of the skin to orbicularis is about 4 to 6 mm right at subbro but as we come to the epitarsal plane it is very very minimal epitarsal skin is thin and orbicularis is also thin orbicularis is less than 0.1 mm thick at the epitarsis it is connected intricately to the skin by interdigitating fibrous septae and also the slips of levator that pass through the orbicularis and insert to the skin indirectly that forms the eyelid crease the origin of course uh, we uh, know that there is orbicularis is a sphincter muscle so it is controversial to talk about origin and insertion sphincter muscles go around but this is what is talked about typically origin is from the nasal part of the frontal bone frontal process of the maxilla in front of the lacrimal crest and from the anterior surface and borders of the medial palpebral ligament this is an overview since i'm running out of time i'll skip this picture but go directly to this this is to show the parts of the orbicularis muscle now it is talked about that orbicularis has two major parts one is the orbital part which go around the eye and the palpebral part which is continuous but anatomically it is continuous but functionally it can be divided into pretarsal part and the preseptal part and the nerve supply is the same nerve it is the facial nerve but the zygomatic branch of the facial nerve supplies which part of the orbicularis the preta who said that me what did you say the pretarsal part pre septal and the pre tarsal part and the temporal branch of the facial nerve supplies the orbital part right so these are the other parts of the orbicularis oculi palpebral pre tarsal it's also called the superficial and deep part and the deep part is called typical grid so it is a combined name that is given currently it's called horner dorney muscle it is the deep part of the palpebral pretarsal orbicularis and there is preseptal orbicularis which also has superficial and deep part then the orbital part so palpebral 
as pretarsal and preceptal, each of which has a superficial and a deep part and the orbital part. Then pars ciliaris is also called muscle of Rylan. Then there is something called pars subtarsalis, which is called clots muscle. Sometimes muscle of Rylan and clots muscle are used to get two individuals described it separately. So it's ideal to give two different names. And there is one part of orbicularis which is associated with the lashes and that's called pars fascicularis. It's called Lefam's muscle, which is a recent description, which results in the eyelash being positioned as it is. Direction of the eyelashes is governed by this Lefam's muscle. That is the proposed explanation. So this is more in detail. Pre palpebral pretarsal muscle originates from the superficial and deep limbs of the medial canthal ligament. Superficial part and deep part, we already said. Superficial part overlies the ampullae and surround the canaliculi, and that is responsible for the lacrimal pump mechanism. Along with the deep part, Horner's muscle or Horner Doveney muscle, which inserts on the posterior lacrimal crest and the lacrimal fascia. So together, superficial and deep part of the pretarsal orbicularis is responsible for lacrimal pump mechanism. Along with that, of course, the deep part of the preceptal orbicularis. So both the pretarsal and the preceptal muscles contribute to lacrimal pump mechanism. And the deep part maintains The globe eyelid a position. So when the deep part contracts, the medial part of the eyelid moves posterior and superior. So whenever a patient has a medial canthal laceration, which is medial to the medial canthus, there is something called unilateral telecanthus. So when you repair it, if you don't take care of the deep part or if you don't pass, you, pass your sutures deep enough, then there will be a standoff of the medial canthal angle. It will not give the depth. If that has to be taken care of even in intranasal or transnasal wiring that you do in patients with blephrophimosis. If you simply do a superficial blephrophimosis correction and don't um, plicate the medial canthal tendon in an appropriate way, don't take your sutures deep enough, then there will be a standoff of the medial canthal angle that will also result in poor punctal apposition to the eyeball and the patient may have epiphora. So we talked about the muscle of Rylan already. Now, preceptal part divides medially into deep head and a superficial head. Laterally, it is one single layer, but as it goes medially, it divides into two parts. Superficial head originates along the upper and the lower margins of the medial canthal ligament, and the deep head arises from the fascia around the lacrimal sac as well as the posterior lacrimal crest, and that's called the Jones muscle. This is a quiz question again. So what is Jones muscle? It is nothing but the preceptal orbicularis oculi. The deep head of it is called the Jones muscle. Laterally, it attaches to the Wittner's tubercle deep to the lateral palpebral raphe. Now, if you look at this picture, you understand what is the relationship of the orbicularis with different, different parts of the orbicularis with the medial canthal tendon. This is the inferior preceptal orbicularis and that is the superior preceptal orbicularis and this is the inferior muscle of Rylan. this is the superior muscle of Rylan. of course that is the tarsal plate and we have the inferior pretarsal orbicularis so this is the preceptal orbicularis this is the pretarsal orbicularis preceptal orbicularis and the pretarsal orbicularis superior and inferior now when you cut this open the superficial head of the superior preceptal orbicularis muscle, you see the deep head, which is attached to the deeper portion of the medial canthal tendon. If we further dissect, you will realize the relationship. This is the medial canthal tendon, which has a very nice architecture. This is just the anterior portion of the medial canthal tendon, which you sometimes cut during DCR. And when you do surgery for blephrophimosis, you pass a suture here and pass it deep there so that you don't pass it anteriorly, you pass it deep there. So this portion of the medial canthal tendon is plicated and that gives the depth to the medial canthus. Otherwise, you will be doing a superficial repair. You also see that this 
posterior part of the medial canthal tendon is posterior to the posterior lacrimal crest. And in between that, there is this network of orbicularis, which will together help the lacrimal pump mechanism. When you cut the medial canthal tendon, you can see that there is this muzzle of Horner's. This is the Horner's muzzle, right? Which is posterior to the posterior crest of the medial canthal tendon. And it is also attached to the lacrimal fascia. So that is the intricate network of muscles in the medial canthal area. Now, orbital portion origin is from the frontal process of the maxilla, from the orbicularis, orbital process of the frontal bone and the medial canthal ligament. And fibers pass around the orbital rim without any interruption in a regular concentric fashion, sometimes interdigitating, sometimes not interdigitating. And they go on to the lateral commissure to insert just inferior to their origin. Now, these are two things that you should remember. This is you generally done in aesthetic surgeries where you uh, explore for suborbicularis oculi fat, that's called SOOF fat, and retro orbicularis oculi fat, that is called the roof fat. Now, roof fat is in the superior aspect, whereas the SOOF fat is in the inferior aspect, especially in the lateral two thirds. True fat is sometimes equated to the subrow fat, which is actually not true. If you look at this particular picture from Dutton, you find that there is what is called superficial forehead fat pocket and lateral malar fat pocket, medial malar fat pocket. All these are superficial fat pockets. And deep to that, you will find the retro orbicularis oculi fat. So this is only in the lateral two thirds and medial one third lacks it. And this is the soup fat, which is present specifically in the lateral part of the inferior orbit and also extend in a tongue-like fashion towards the medial orbit in a slightly different configuration. So this is the true fat and the soup fat concept. Now, peculiarity about orbicularis oculi is that it has dual blood supply. It is supplied by both the facial artery and superficial temporal artery, which are parts of the external carotid artery and ophthalmic artery, which is part of the internal carotid artery. So it has dual blood supply from two major sources, both internal carotid as, external, as well as external carotid. I wanted to ask you this question, but anyway, since there is lack of time, I'll go ahead. So orbicularis oculi, different parts have different function. Involuntary blinking is by preceptal and pretarsal component. So how many blinks per minute, Ruju? How many blinks per minute? If you're not using your digital device. Subo? How many blinks per minute? 16 to 18, sir. Equivalent to the Respiratory rate, 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 right? So 12 to 16, 16 to 18 is acceptable. That is the involuntary blinking. Force closure is contributed to by both the orbital and the preceptal. So as you forcefully try to close the lid, it is contributed by orbital and preceptal orbicularis, whereas squeeze is typically by the orbital, right? So if you are assessing ob orbicularis oculi function by asking the patient to forcefully squeeze against resistance, you're only assessing the function of the orbital component of orbicularis oculi, which is supplied by a different branch of the facial nerve. Where if you want to assess the function of the uh, preceptal and pre part of the orbicularis, you look at the blink rate of a patient. So if the patient is blinking adequately, then his orbicularis is functioning well. So often following blepharoplasty, if you're ex excised too much of in blepharoplasty, you predominantly excise the preceptal orbicularis, isn't it? So that can affect the blink rate of a patient. That is why if a patient has a borderline dry eye, that can get worse following blepharoplasty. Or if a patient has borderline dry eye, that can also get worse following botulinum toxin injection in a patient with a functional disorder or a cosmetic indication where you inject botulinum because that will affect the blink rate because you are paralyzing, partially paralyzing the preceptal and pre orbicularis oculi, especially in patients who have blepharospasm. You're paralyzing it. You're giving Botox in the pre as well as 
three septal area. In patients who have ALO, etc., you give extensive injection in the pretarsal preceptal orbicularis, and that can cause reduction in blink rate. Squeeze, I said, and lacrimal pump is contributed by both Honors and Jones. Resurfacing of the tear film is the main function of the preceptal and pretarsal orbicularis. And lipid pump, lipid pump is nothing but expression of the contents of the muscles of um, or the glands of Zeiss and the mebumin gland. It is contributed to by pretarsal and the muscle of Rhyola. And lash configuration is contributed to by the muscle of Lifam, which is the fascicular part of the orbicularis. So medial canthal tendon has a very complex arrangement. It is not called a ligament anymore because, because ligament connects what to what? A muscle to a bone or a bone, muscle fibrous tissue to a bone, which mm -hmm. is a tendon, which is a ligament. Uh, Something that connects the muscle to the bone is called a tendon, mm -hmm. whereas a fibrous structure to a bone is called a ligament. So it is currently called a medial canthal ligament because it connects the terminal portion of the tarsus to the bone. Medial canthal ligament anteriorly to the anterior lacrimal crest attaches superiorly along the frontal process of the maxilla and the frontal bone. The deep part passes along the lacrimal fascia to insert on the posterior lacrimal crest and it serves structurally as the anterior border of the deep pretarsal muscles. Now, if you look at this picture, you see that we already shown that there are two parts to it, the superficial part and the deeper part. In between that would be the lacrimal sac. So we already pointed out that successful medial canthal reconstruction would involve re-establishment of the posterior vector by taking your sutures deep. Of course, not at the expense of the lacrimal sac. You cannot pass your sutures at the posterior lacrimal crest, but as deep as possible without distance disturbing the lacrimal sac so much. But of course, if you are doing transnasal wiring, then you can avoid getting into the lacrimal sac by using your drill posterior to the posterior lacrimal crest after separating the lacrimal sac. And that is the reason why these patients have Epiphora and Centurion syndrome because they have a hypertrophic or a overacting anterior portion of the medial canthal tendon, which pulls the puncta away from the eyeball resulting in poor punctal position and also any eyelid laxity, especially the eyelid laxity involving the medial canthal tendon or eyelid laxity involving the lateral canthal tendon or uh, horizontal expansion of the eyelid can weaken the lacrimal pump mechanism resulting in epiphore. Just a few pictures showing the medial canthal tendon architecture, how beautiful it is. So this is the inferior crust of the medial canthal tendon. That would be the area of the punctum and the canaliculus actually is entering in that area now and it will exit and it will go posterior to it. The common canaliculus is actually posterior to the anterior crust of the medial canthal tendon. So if you are cutting medial canthal tendon or if you have to cut your medial canthal tendon during your DCR surgery, never cut it on the soft tissue because the common canaliculus will be right there. If you ever have to cut it, cut it on the bone right here, about 2 millimeter from the orbital margin so that you can easily reflect it, get enough space to make flap in the lacrimal sac, but at the same time not disturb the common canaliculus. After cutting the medial canthal tendon, just for the demonstration purpose, this picture shows that this is the posterior arm of the medial canthal tendon. Very nice architecture enclosing the lacrimal sac. This is the cross section which shows that this is the nasolacrimal duct, terminal end of the lacrimal sac and the nasolacrimal duct. And this is the anterior arm and this is the posterior arm of the medial canthal tendon. Very nice architecture again. And lateral canthal ligament, it is nothing but the attenuated fibrous lateral tarsal terminations and it has two crura, upper as well as the lower, upper crust and the lower crust of the lateral canthal tendon, which is practically important because when you're doing an upper lid reconstruction, you do a lateral cantholysis of that respective crust. Suppose you're doing upper lid reconstruction, you do a cantholysis of the upper crust. If you're doing a lower lid reconstruction, if you want relaxation, you do for the lower crust. 
if you simply do lateral canthotomy, that will not relax the eyelid. Lateral canthotomy will, of course, relieve pressure over the eyeball if you have a retrovulvar hemorrhage or if a patient has acute orbital hematoma, but that will not uh, give relaxation to the eyelid. In fact, even in patients who have a retrovulvar hemorrhage, if you want to reduce pressure over the eyeball and does op indirect optic nerve compression, you should do a cantholysis as well, either the upper or the lower that will relax the eyelids more effectively than just doing a canthotomy. Then um, the length is of course given common lateral canthal ligament is one millimeter thick, three millimeter wide and about five to seven millimeter long. It inserts at the Wittnell's lateral orbital tubercle, 1.5 to three millimeter inside the lateral orbital trim and pre-tarsal orbicularis inserts three to four millimeter deep. Now, whenever you do a lateral canthal procedure, be it a lateral canthal tendon plication for patients who have a lateral canthal tendon weakness, that you detect clinically by looking at the lateral canthal configuration. Lateral canthal configuration should be sharp like this. If lateral canthus is rounded, that means that there is dehiscence or dissensation or laxity of the lateral canthal tendon. Then you can actually plicate it. But whenever you plicate it, the suture has to be taken deeper to the posterior orbital margin. So basically, this is the anterior orbital margin, lateral orbital margin. That's the posterior orbital margin. Your suture has to come through the periosteum deep. Of course, you can tie it here, but your suture bite has to reattach it there or plicate it there. Whenever you do a lateral tarsal strip, lateral tarsal strip has to be attached to the posterior lip of the bone and not to the anterior so that you give depth to the lateral canthus. Otherwise, it will have a lifted up lateral canthus, which will not really look good. Now, uh, lateral canthal uh, ligament is also connected to the lateral rectus check ligament. So whenever the patient looks extreme medially, there is slight amount of medial movement of the lateral canthal angle. When the patient look extremely laterally, there would be some lateral movement of the lateral canthal angle. It is also a structure where the orbital septum gets attached and also the lateral horn of the levator gets attached. Lacrimal gland, uh, palpable lobe of the lacrimal gland is invested in a fascia that also gets attached superiorly and Lockwood ligament gets attached inferiorly. And again, if you're fond of names, then there is something called Eisler's pocket. Eisler's pocket is nothing, uh, it's not a pocket of, uh, uh, you know, it's not, not a, uh, common pocket, it is, it's an anatomical description. It is anterior to the lateral canthal ligament and posterior to the septum. So it is between the part, it is, it is anterior to the lateral canthal ligament and posterior to the septum. So it, it is in between the septum and the anterior canthal ligament. This you find as a triangular space, which uh, there is fat present. So this is the architecture of the lateral canthal ligament. This is the Wittnell's tubercle, which is about 1.5 to 3 millimeter. This is the anterior lateral orbital margin. This is the posterior lateral orbital margin. You can see that Wittnell's tubercle is not at the anterior orbital margin, but is at the posterior orbital margin and is about 1.5 millimeter to deep. So it can start here or it can start there to which the posterior aspect of the lateral canthal tendon attaches, whereas this is the anterior part of the lateral attachments and the lateral canthal tendon. This is to further show that uh, the lateral canthal tendon is actually related to the lacrimal gland fascia. There is the palpebral lobe and the lateral horn of the levator palpebrae superioris and the inferior crust is very closely adherent to the uh, blockwood ligament. This is to show the tarsal architecture, how beautifully uh, it is anchored on both sides by the medial canthal ligament and the lateral canthal ligament. And that keeps the tarsus in a stable position when there is so much of dynamism of the eyelid, both the upper as well as the lower. And we'll address the tarsus when we talk about the second part of the anatomy. I think uh, since we are run out of time, I'll stop here and stop at the orbital septum and we can cover it along with the levator and rest of it. So uh, that is the end of it. If you have any questions, you can answer. So what I've left out, I've covered. 
uh, is SERS network unstable? I guess so. Okay, uh, do any of you have any questions as such? Yes. <laughs> because there are none on the uh, on YouTube or on Facebook, so you can go ahead. Yeah, just a few practical tips. Uh, like mm -hmm. I think uh, first one you can answer because I remember you have a video also of uh, TOSIS workup. So uh, when we have multiple eyelid creases, uh, what is the most prom and like many patients have like a very prominent eyelid crease and a crease no, below. One second, Chefale, I thought I got disconnected because there was a power shutdown. Yeah. When, in which part did I get disconnected? Nothing, sir. So I think so you had she was just asking some questions, sir. Okay. About multiple lid creases. Okay. But okay. first of all, I would like to thank you, sir, for that very, very amazing. Yeah, I, think I'm I think that uh, explains why we are so confusing. About, no, excited about ocular plasty because it's so amazing. And uh, as you rightly said, uh, I think it uh, some simple structure like an eye cannot be covered. Even I think even if you would have gone for one more hour, we would have like listened to like the intricacies of the anatomy. And most interesting was even a simple thing like eyebrow, which many people shave off, as you were saying, it also required six slides for its description. So <laughs> that was really nice. Uh, so I was just asking a few questions, sir. I think Ritika was about to answer. Ritika will answer all the questions. <laughs> so when we're doing a ptosis workup, uh, sometimes when we ask the patient to look up and we uh, the patient has multiple eyelid creases. Uh, and so do we take the most prominent one that most is prominent one. the first one that appears? Uh, so basically, it will be the most prominent one because it's it's... Multiple lid creases basically indicates that it's attaching at different levels. There has been a dehiscence and it is attaching at there are multiple insertions to it. So take the most prominent one. I think it, yeah, I that, is, know, it, that is correct. Most prominent one that also indicates that there is eyelid laxity. That's so it. yeah, so you always take the most prominent one for your purpose of your incision. If yeah. none of the creases is most more uh, prominent and all of yeah. them are equivocal. Then you, you go take by it to the other uh, go by measurement, measurement mm -hmm. for an appropriate gender appropriate measurement, slightly mm -hmm. um, higher in males and slightly lower in females. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, second question is uh, sometimes you use fillers for epiblepharon. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what is the plane of injection of that filler? Subopicularis. Subopicularis, okay. So, that will kind of like evert the eyelid, uh, right. correcting the uh, misdirection of the lashes. Okay. And similarly, sir, what is the plane of the Botox injection that we give? Depends. Depends on the uh, pathology and the muscle which you're addressing. Suppose you're giving to procerus, obviously you have to be deep. You cannot give it subcutaneous. But if you're giving for orbicularis, then, you know, it is subcutaneous. It's anterior to the orbicularis plane. You don't give Botox deep into the muscle then because what happens is if you're deep into the orbicularis, then the next structure that will be there is levator, right? So you don't want to paralyze the levator. You don't want to cause ptosis. You want to be superficial to orbicularis in the superficial fibers of orbicularis. So typically when you give Botox for say blepharospasm, you want to see a blep. That means that you are slightly deeper to the skin okay. on top of the orbicularis. You're not into the orbicularis. When you're into the orbicularis or deeper than that, you don't see a blep. Mm -hmm. Right? That means that you're deeper. So if you don't see a blep, then uh, you should not proceed further. Mm -hmm. You should withdraw the needle slightly more superficially, make it more superficial and inject because you want to only paralyze the selected muscle. Suppose you want to inject into procedures, you should know the direction and go right into the muscle and inject because if you inject superficially, mm -hmm. then obviously procedures being a deeper muscle, that will not get affected. Mm -hmm. The muscle lying on top of it, corrugator may get affected. Mm -hmm. So you hit the bone, withdraw by half a millimeter and give to procedures. Uh, and so another question is about uh, brow ptosis. Yeah. Uh, in many uh, elderly uh, patients, we see brow ptosis is there. So when do we decide to treat it and uh, how do we treat it? Yeah, when do we decide to treat it? There is no functional indication, no uh, functional indication for brow ptosis. It's only an aesthetic indication. But if you're doing blepharoplasty and if a patient has extreme degree of brow ptosis, if you only do blepharoplasty, you'll worsen brow ptosis. And your... Uh, results of blepharoplasty will be completely negated because it will draw bro into the lid area, right? 
So if you're doing blepharoplasty, even for functional indications, if the bro is lax, it's always a good idea to fix the bro. And the easiest way to fix is a transblepharopexy. You already done a skin incision. Go into the subarbicularis plane. I already showed the layer of uh, putaman put urist, which is actually subarbicularis, right? So if you go in that plane, then you will be able to reach the periosteum and you simply pass suture through the periosteum and take deeper part of the bro without causing any cushioning artifact or effect. That means that pin cushion kind of a thing should not be there. Otherwise, it will be causing an invisible putting, uh, what do you call it, pitting in the bro. That should not be there. So if you pass your sutures too, too much with the bro tissue, then that will be deforming. So you only take the deeper part of the bro tissue and suture it to the periosteum. And so, uh, sometimes that uh, up, uh, uh, incision above the brow is described where we just take out uh, skin and just... That is that bro, yeah, supra bro skin approach propexy or bro uh, repair is something that I would discourage because that incision will always be seen. It's mm -hmm. never going to be a hidden incision. So if at all you want to do it, then it should be endoscopic if you want to do it from the uh, non bluff approach. That's ideal or use endotines, etc. But not, I wouldn't encourage unless it's a very severe functional problem. Uh, if a patient has so much of broad descent that you cannot, cannot do blepharoplasty and the only way to do it is by the skin approach, then you can do it. But in an aged patient who already has a lot of frontal creases, if not in a patient who wants aesthetic benefit, you can't give a bad looking incision. And so similarly, uh, last ptosis, when we are doing a ptosis surgery, any steps mm -hmm. that uh, you would uh, tell, like give a practical tip about just to correct that last ptosis also? Yes. Last ptosis, I mean, the way to correct is that you have to go dissect sub orbicularis and you should start seeing the roots of lashes, those black dots. The moment you see it, you pass vical sutures through the epitassal area and then hitch it slightly higher. So you only pass sutures, which is above the lash line, and hitch it slightly higher. So only by that technique can you correct lash doses to a certain extent, but not grossly. You cannot correct lash doses completely. I think that covers all our questions, sir. So uh, thank you so much again. for. One of the questions was about anatomy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Practical aspects. <laughs> Planes, we were talking about planes. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, Finally, we saw the Dutton. Hmm? <laughs> Finally, we saw the Dutton. Dutton, okay. Finally, you saw Dutton. <laughs> Which is all credit to Dutton. Yes, sir. So, thank you so much again uh, for the lecture. And we are looking forward to the part two that you'll be covering with the, uh, uh, soon in the coming few weeks. Uh, and next, we uh, meet on August 4th, uh, which will be a lecture by Dr. Roshmi Gupta. And uh, that will be embryology and congenital anom anomalies of the eyelids. So that, that is coming Friday. So see you all for the ex ex exciting lineup of all the lectures. You. As you can see, we are very excited for Plasti module to be.